Hi, everyone. This is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. I'm really excited to have a first time guest here today, but I've actually listened to his interviews and I've been reading a good number of Bitcoin books like The Age of Cryptocurrencies and I'm just reading Digital Gold now. So I'm hearing about his story. He's a entrepreneur and investor, uh, most specifically in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. He's also a libertarian, I guess. Eric Voorhees, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Now, I'm Eric. You have a really interesting background. Um, I, I believe before you became a Bitcoin entrepreneur, uh, you lived up in New Hampshire, I guess, at the Free State Project. Uh, how did you become a libertarian? Um, well, I think I slowly slid into that notion over time. Uh, it wasn't really ever an epiphany moment, but um, I was always fairly antagonistic toward the idea of governments telling people what they could do with their own with their own bodies and lives. And um, so as I, as I got older, that sort of, you know, matured into my, my current worldview. And uh, obviously when, when Bitcoin came along, that, that fit right on in there. So I, um, I was very happy to see that. Is that how you found Bitcoin uh, up in New Hampshire? Uh, how did, how did you find Bitcoin? Because, um you know, I found it through my friend, Trace Meyer. Uh, he told me about it in 2010, I think, but, I, I didn't really research it. The stories he was telling me about it, it, it just like I, I was. La- I admit I was lazy at the time. I, I didn't do the research work into listening to anything he said at the time. Yeah, Tra- Trace is great. Um, he's he's a good friend. Uh, yeah, it was just uh, one of the the free staters. I was up at the in the Free State Project in New Hampshire, and yeah, one of them had posted on Facebook about Bitcoin, and this was in mid 2011. And uh, so after reading about it for a couple hours, I got completely addicted. And haven't really looked back since. Now, did, were you a computer programmer? Did you did you do any of the coding, or um, no. uh, how did you get involved in in the Bitcoin uh, yeah, industry I, then? I think I was one of the first people in the industry that really had no development background whatsoever, so I can't code at all. Um, my background professionally is in marketing and brand development, and um, so I, you know, I. I was able to look at things a little differently than people and communicate it in a way that I think a lot of the developers were not. So I, I think kind of my, my early role was just trying to help convey the, uh, the, the virtues of Bitcoin to the world. Um, and even though a lot of people that understood the, the mechanism and how that was solid and how the programming actually worked, you know, normal people don't care about that. So they needed to hear something else about why Bitcoin was so important. Yeah, I think that's a very important point you brought up, that most people don't care about all the specifics behind the blockchain technology. They just care that it works and that, you know, they can pull up their app on their uh, smartphone and pay in Bitcoin at um, at their convenience somewhere. And, you know, the transaction runs pretty smoothly. I think that's like one of the main points that people care about the most. Yeah, mo- most things people use, they have no idea how it works, right? I mean, very few people actually understand how a computer works or how the Internet works or how their wireless modem works or even how their how their car works. You know, a lot of people couldn't, couldn't really tell you much about how their car works. So, you know, ultimately people use these things as tools to do things in their lives that are, that are important to them. And money is a, is a tool and a very important one. People don't really need to care about how it works, but they should care. Um, they should care about what it, what it is, what it's made of and that they can, that they can trust it and they shouldn't, they should be able to know why they can trust it and they should understand where money comes from and, and why and how it's, important and and why and how it's manipulated by people yeah i mean throughout history there's always been examples of of governments or uh banking uh people in higher banking or other economic and political elites special interest groups always trying to figure out ways to manipulate a market or create money out of thin air create a scam and stuff like that i mean there's just so many countless examples of that sure yeah i I think the the ultimate scam of the world is uh fiat currency and uh, I mean, basically, one certain group of people in the world has this privilege to create money out of thin air that everyone else has to use. Um, and it's it's quite absurd. I mean, I think anyone should be allowed to create money out of thin air. But the point is not that one is creating one's own money. The point is that when you force everyone to use what you're creating, um, that gives you a uh, essentially monopoly power over that product. So we live in a world where we have monopoly ownership and control of money. 
And I think that's completely antithetical to capitalism and to markets to have the most important good in the market be centrally planned and controlled is absurd. But for some reason, people are are used to it and they seem to just not ignore that um, that that's going on. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I'm I'm all for fav- I'll, all yeah. I'm all in favor of competing currencies. You know, let let the market figure out what works best for what situation. You know, if people want to pay in large purchases with some uh, with one form of currency or money, then that's fine. If they want to pay in small uh, small purchases with something else, then that's fine. Rather than government, you know, mandating something by fiat or decree or forcing legal tender down people's throats and then you know allowing them to inflate the money supply or create money out of thin air and stuff like that. Yeah, it's uh, and and you know before Bitcoin came along, people sort of had to just accept that there wasn't really a viable alternative. So you could complain and whine about it. Maybe you could get a small group of people to 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 vote in some way over some small issue somewhere, but but you, you were kind of stuck. There wasn't really much you could do. Um, you know, gold has always been a good form of money, but it doesn't work for normal commerce because you have to digitize it because you can't be walked around with actual gold coins and trying to divide them up and recombine them. That's impractical. So you'd have to have like a digital gold system, and those are problematic because they can be shut down by governments um, as soon as they get large enough. So there's never really been an, an economic alternative to the fiat system that was viable. And finally, we have we have one, and it's called Bitcoin. Yeah, I agree about gold. Um, gold is really good for savings and insurance right now, but the old gold standard where you're actually walking around with gold coins is really dangerous. I mean, there would be a lot of thefts, and you would have to carry around a lot of metal just to buy something. That's why I think you know the gold standard adapted. It switched to paper certificates or receipts, right, where the goldsmith would keep the gold stored in the vault, and the paper was a lot easier. It was it was new technology at the time, you know, the paper receipts where the paper would just change hands, and then if the people wanted their metal, they could go get it later. Otherwise, you know, the people just kept the receipts as um, the receipts as they were a substitute for gold. So I guess Bitcoin, um, it, it's really amazing, the innovation that's come along, like uh, with Bitcoin and the blockchain. The, the blockchain has really solved some amazing problems that I guess people in computer science have been trying for, for decades to solve and hadn't solved. Yeah. Um, basically, while Bitcoin is cool as a money, it, it lives on this essentially new invention that I think will go down in history as one of the most important of all time, one of the great human accomplishments, and that's the blockchain. And the blockchain essentially allows uh, society to create a, a record of irrefutable truth that no uh, single person or, or entity or group or government um has censorship rights over or uh, can control. So when you think about that, it's the, the ramifications are quite profound. Um, you know, typically when it came to systems of money, there was always someone, some trusted party that you had to use, like uh, whether it's a bank, you know, you're trusting the bank, whether it's uh, PayPal, you know, you're trusting that company. Um, and generally that works pretty well. The trust, the trust works pretty well, but it doesn't, work all the time and it can be prone to serious failures and collapses um, and and also it can just be prone to to normal censorship which inhibits what people are able to do and so now you have this this record of transactions on the blockchain on Bitcoin's blockchain that can't be censored or controlled by any single party um, and just just as the internet has revolutionized the way that people talk to each other because that is uh, uh, decentralized as well, and no one really controls that. Uh, so too with with Bitcoin, and it's going to change a lot about how people interact with each other economically. Yeah, it's also started to be more competitive there for lowering prices, which is what you know free markets do. They make uh, the market more competitive. They produce a higher quality goods and services at a low price. Whereas you know government issued monopolies or oligopolies like with taxicab companies and Uber, it prevented that. Um, you know we're starting to see the fees that Western Union used to drastically overcharge a lot of people to move money out of the country. You know, immigrants, hardworking immigrants who'd want to send money back home to their families. I think Western Union now, Eric, is, is, has drastically lowered their prices. And, and I think Bitcoin has a, a, lot of, um, a lot of responsibility for why they've had to lower their prices drastically to compete. Uh, well, B- Bitcoin is not yet seriously competing with big companies like that, but it absolutely will be. So if they're lowering prices in anticipation of that competition, then that's 
that's smart of them. But of course, it's not just the cost of sending money that Bitcoin um, solves. You know, like the fact is that money is essentially digital already. Like the, the dollars that people use are already digital. The vast majority of them are anyway. And the vast majority of transactions are digital. So why in the world should, when you're sending digital money around, why in the world should it take three to five days for your money to do a, a bank transfer from one country or, or another? It, it is faster to to ship an anvil by FedEx across the Atlantic than to send money to someone in London. And that's absurd. Um, the money is digital already, so it should move instantly anywhere. Bitcoin does that. Yeah, I, I agree. It just doesn't make sense. But there's so many, the banking and financial industry, Eric, like I worked in financial services, there's so many compliance and regulatory stuff and everything's mm -hmm. slow and there's drastic, you know, fees and red tape and stuff like that. So it, it doesn't surprise me when a new technology like Bitcoin comes around that someone's going to still try to over-regulate it um, going forward. Yeah. And, and I, that was like what really hooked me is just the first time I tried it and I sent money to someone and you, you just, you feel it. It's like, it's like waking up to this new this new amazing thing that you'd never experienced before and, and you suddenly realize like, ah, that that is how money should be transferred. That is the civilized way that people should engage with each other. And and now every time I have to like walk into a bank branch and fill out a wire transfer form or pay fees to, to move essentially ones and zeros across the world, it just seems so archaic to me and so, so silly. But it, I guess it takes the world a long time to, to move past its old tendencies. Yeah, it's like the difference between, you know, writing a letter out by hand or sending an email or a text message. You know, now most people only send emails or text messages. You rarely see people send out handwritten letters anymore, and that's just because it's more efficient um, for most situations and society and business and stuff has adapted. Yeah, it's but and, and of course, remember in the early and mid-90s when people were not used to email yet, a lot of, uh, a lot of people didn't really feel like adopting it, and they would often say, well, what, I don't understand. I could just write the person a letter. I don't understand what the point of this is. You know, no one, even if I get an email address, no one else is going to have one. So it's not really, it's not worth my time. Um, and now everyone uses it for everything. And, you know, that, that transition took, took a decade. Um, I imagine the, the same kind of thing is going to happen with Bitcoin. It's, it's had the same arguments against it. You know, why, why do I need Bitcoin when I already have PayPal? Um, and, you know, even if I set up Bitcoin, no one else is going to accept it. But those things change at the margins gradually over time. And soon enough, everyone's going to be using this new this new system without even realizing it. Yeah, I agree. It takes a while for a network effect to, to develop. Um, which industries, in your opinion, do you think the blockchain could disrupt maybe besides um, just Bitcoin and, uh, you know, payment systems? Um, the legal industry is is ripe for disruption. Uh, basically, the, the blockchain, because you now have this irrefutable record of truth, you can, you can build contracts that can't be uh, can't be gamed and contracts that can execute themselves automatically because they're, they're based on software. So, um, you know, for example, you could have um, a digital contract written up that essentially disperses a certain amount of money to some heirs of an estate upon the death of someone. And they die and the program automatically executes. It doesn't need uh, an estate planner to like go through documents and figure out if signatures were valid. And, and this whole arduous process of verifying information that people have today, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, all that stuff gets uh, totally, totally replaced over the next 20 years. And so there's going to be quite a bit of interesting innovation there. That sounds really good. Um, I, I know I know a whole bunch of lawyers that are probably listening that probably won't like that, but um, you know that that's how it is with technology. They're going to have to adapt, or they're they're going to become dinosaurs. Yeah, and there's and you know whenever something disruptive happens, the people who are being disruptive always kick and scream. Um, but I think everyone's glad that that we don't all exist as subsistence farmers anymore. Even though, of course, you know, we all lost our jobs as farmers. And shouldn't we be mad about that? Shouldn't we be complaining about, <laughs> about the fact that we, we can't be farmers anymore? But ultimately, I think people are glad to have moved on and lived in a, a wealthier society because of it. 
Yeah, I agree. The the buggy whip manufacturers hated hated the automobile guys for a long time. I know I know in England they managed to block it. I think more than pretty much any other countries, which is why England, uh, even though they were one of the strongest countries in the world at the time, didn't you know have a monopoly on the automobile manufacturing because they had so many older industries trying to block the automobile guys from um, taking over. Yeah, the uh, actually the automobile industry in Britain is. Uh, very interesting to look at in the early days. They also had this ridiculous regulation, and this is, of course, uh, very relevant to what's happening with Bitcoin in the U.S. And the, and the regulation that's being proposed around it. But essentially, back in the day in Britain, um, because cars were dangerous, and of course cars are dangerous, uh, all this regulation was proposed on how cars could be uh, driven. And some of these things... Uh, were were really absurd. For example, there was a law on the books for a while that if an automobile was going to be driven, it required a crew of, I believe, three people, one to, <laughs> one to drive it, one to walk like a hundred yards in front of the car, waving flags and warning the t- warning anyone nearby that a car was coming, and then uh, like one other person behind the car to make sure it didn't fall apart or something. And the car had to have all these like flags on it and make all this noise and um, you know basically just this <laughs> this tendency of people to be scared of what's of what's new just because it can present some danger. And so certainly the same thing is happening with Bitcoin because now you know it is a very useful tool. So the fact that anyone can send value anywhere in the world instantly is very powerful. And certainly some bad people can use that for bad things. And so various government regulators are are using that as a pretense to make all sorts of absurd laws, just like they did in Britain with the early car industry. So, so you would call then the regulation that's uh, occurring now in the U.S. Uh, towards Bitcoin and blockchain companies and uh, other altcoins, uh, you'd call that onerous then? Oh, not not only onerous, but 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 dangerous uh, and costly. For example, um, so. Identity theft in the U.S. is a huge problem, right? People have identity stolen all the time because whenever they pay for things online um, or even at a store with their credit card, all their personal information gets conveyed with that transaction. So credit cards are really crude in that you need to give all sorts of personal information along with the payment in order for the receiver to, to verify it. Um, so I, I, it's like, a, I think in 2012, the statistic I saw was that it was a $24 billion of losses in the United States due to identity theft. And to give you some perspective, all other property crimes from like burglary to car theft, all that stuff, all that combined was like 12 or $14 billion in losses. So it's, a, it's you know, the biggest crime problem in the U.S. is, is maybe one way to think about it. And uh, finally, Bitcoin comes around and allows people to pay each other and store money without personal information, making it private. So personal information doesn't have to be attached uh, to your to your payments, which would completely solve this identity theft problem because you don't need to leave the information everywhere you go. Um, and regulators like in New York State are essentially mandating that Bitcoin companies, even though the payments don't require it, to still collect all of this information all this personal private information uh, through what's known as know your customer laws. Um, So (laughs) we have this technical solution to this huge multi-billion dollar theft problem. And the government is stepping in immediately to make sure that (laughs) the problem doesn't get solved, but that it continues. Well, Eric, the, the gov- I, I don't know how you feel about this, but the government is collecting way too much of our information and data as is, and I, unfortunately, I only see it getting worse. I mean, look at all the stuff that Edward Snowden has revealed and WikiLeaks has revealed about, you know, all these secret uh, programs and stuff like that where they're collecting all this metadata and other stuff. So it, it doesn't surprise me, you know, that they want to collect more of our data, you know, whether it's financial data or Facebook photos or any of that stuff. Yeah, well, and obviously government agencies want this information for themselves, but but even if you're one of those people who thinks that the government should be able to get whatever information it wants because it's uh, all powerful and, and um, all good, even if you're one of those crazy people, you should still be very concerned about this because governments are completely inept at, at keeping that data safe. So it gets hacked all the time. And the fact that you have to give your payment data to your personal information with every payment that you're making is not just if you're scared of what the government will do to it, but collecting all that information into these databases is what becomes the target for hackers. 
And so whether it's, you know, a company that gets hacked or, or a government branch or, or any kind of organization, it doesn't matter. The fact that information is being collated and collected is the problem. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, the IRS actually just got a major hack. Uh, they're, I think they're blaming, you know, Russian hackers or something like that. But, um, you know, they lost a whole bunch of important data in the last couple of weeks. So yeah, they had 100,000 very... 100, tax returns of 100,000 people got stolen. You know, all that all that private information is now in the hands of the hackers. A lot of those people are going to have identity theft problems. And it's just this whole, you know, this whole nonsense that your personal information needs to be attached to a transaction. I mean, imagine if we applied that standard to other, other things, like if your personal information had to be attached um, and submitted to the government, whenever you made a public statement, whenever you talk to someone, right? Like whenever you communicate with your friend, you have to provide that Soviet. personal that sounds <laughs> completely Soviet. totalitarian, right? Yeah, but it's it's yeah. no worse than having to attach all your information when you make a financial transaction. You know, whether you're communicating with with words or with money, both of them are equally dangerous in the hands of bad people, um, and both of them are are fundamentally personal decisions between private parties. It really has nothing to do with the government. And just because there might be some bad things that happen with money doesn't give the government the justification to take all that information any more than the, the fact that bad things can be done with uh, with words and ideas as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, you know, the, the onerous regulations here for the money and collecting the data, it's, it's basically presuming, you know, that everyone's guilty and not innocent, whereas, you know, in our Constitution, we're supposed to be presumed innocent and then proven guilty. It just seems like things have kind of, you know, reversed on their heads, and it seems like it's the other way around where they're assuming almost everyone's guilty now. Yeah, there's sort of a, a foundation of law that, that suggests that, you know, like, at least in your, in your house, you have the, the right to privacy by default, right? You can lock your doors and, and cover your windows. You don't have to report on what's going on in your house, uh, and thank goodness. Not yet. And if, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if if the government believes some sort of crime is in there or something, there's this warrant process where they have to show justification and get a a warrant from a judge to go get that to to break your privacy essentially. And for some reason, in the digital world and in the financial world, um, that hasn't been extended. And I think it's because the government doesn't want that privacy to be extended and most people do not uh, care enough about these issues they're they're too busy with their bread and circuses to really pay attention to the fact that all their default privacy is being uh, given up and, and taken away and so now we are at the point where the the government assumes that it gets all your information by by default and trying to make the the case that they should not have all that information by default now you're fighting the uphill battle that was supposed to be guaranteed by the Constitution. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, well said. Now, um, can governments kill Bitcoin? Because there's a lot of people out there that are, oh, the government, uh, oh, the Chinese government, oh, the United States government, they can shut down Bitcoin whenever they want, or they can, you know, tax it to the wazoo and make it uh, damn near impossible to use and make it, um, you know, put a negative incentive in place to even use it at all. Well, what's your opinion on this? Uh, yeah, well, especially back in the day, like in 2011 and 12, uh, before governments had really taken any notice of Bitcoin, um, on the forums and stuff, we'd always argue this this question. You know, how much damage could governments do to to Bitcoin? Could they kill it? Could they just harm it? Is it totally immune from them? Um, and of course, no one no one knows. But the key is that there's no central point that the government could take out. So there's no there's no Bitcoin office. There's no Bitcoin company. There's no Bitcoin server. Uh, it's all distributed. Um, so that makes it at least, you know, orders of magnitude more difficult to to stop. And I think ultimately now that the technology exists, um, it's like an idea. You know, an idea can be killed. And the idea of how you get this distributed trust system, um, you know, that we call the blockchain, now that that exists, I, I think humanity will not accept uh, governments trying to shut that down because the the efficiencies uh, that 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 will bring to the world are are too immense for people to, to to tolerate its loss. Just as they just as people would not tolerate the loss of the internet if the government tried to shut that down. Um, so, you know, I think the government probably realizes that they they they'll just try to regulate the hell out of it 
and I'm sure they will. But of course, uh, Bitcoin is not an American phenomenon, it's global. And so governments are sort of in this awkward position where the more they regulate it, the more this new industry will bloom outside of the country. And as long as it's not, you know, completely banned everywhere in the world, uh, it'll have a place to flourish. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And one thing, one thing that I think is in Bitcoin's favor that is preventing governments from trying to kill it more is that Wall Street and Silicon Valley seem to be embracing Bitcoin and the blockchain now. Um, I, I know there's a lot of libertarians out there that are very um, skeptical about Wall Street embracing Bitcoin, but how do you feel about it as a Bitcoin entrepreneur? Well, I think it's, I mean, ultimately the goal of, my goal with Bitcoin is for it to completely take over the world and, and totally dominate finance. Um, and that doesn't happen without finance merging with Bitcoin. So, you know, you can't grow and become successful without getting more and more users. And so the fact that there are more and more users is a, a good thing. The fact that Wall Street's figuring out ways to use this technology is is great. Now, if some of them try to use it for corrupt ends, you know, they'll they'll, they'll do that with any medium of exchange that they can get their hands on. But that doesn't that doesn't tarnish uh, the reputation of of Bitcoin. You know, if anything, Bitcoin will keep a lot of uh, entities honest in ways that they otherwise couldn't be. Yeah, that's well well said. I think Bitcoin's you know it's a piece of technology. It's neither good nor evil, right? So it it just depends on whether what the person's using it for. So you know if someone's trying to figure out a way to manipulate Bitcoin or hack in, you know, and do the hashing problem, and I guess gain what fifty one percent of the hashing power. If Wall Street's coming up with schemes for that, then that's bad. But you know if they're just going to use Bitcoin and lower fees for their customers, then and maybe like. Uh, store some of their information in like an altcoin right on the blockchain, then I, I don't see any problems with Wall Street embracing the blockchain technology. Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, the technology has to be able to withstand evil intentions. So, you know, no one should be idealistic and think that everyone's just going to use things for peaceful purposes. Um, people might, people will try to use Bitcoin for all sorts of terrible things. And the technology has to be able to to withstand that. It has to be able to withstand malicious actors. And, um, you know, I, I see no reason why, why it won't. It's, again, like you said, just a tool. And do, do you think like the, um, the open source stuff is allowing like a lot of the problems that were initially with Bitcoin? Do you think a lot of those problems are going to get solved because of open source and the other hardworking, you know, computer programmers working on Bitcoin a lot? Well, for something like Bitcoin, it has to be open source because you Closed source means that you're trusting the people who have access to that closed source. Open source means that anyone can read the code and, and, and change it. And so for something to be decentralized, you cannot, it cannot be closed source. That would be antithetical. Um, my final question is for you, Eric. I, I want to talk about your successes as an entrepreneur um, because we have a lot of listeners out there who just graduated college or they're in business school and you know they're learning about business and investing and they, they want to learn to become entrepreneurs. Um, how challenging was it for you to become an entrepreneur? Well, it's certainly hard and most ideas fail. And then, um, I mean, ultimately, you got to you got to find things that you think are going to be valuable and build them and you're going to fail. And then you got to figure out what happened and, and do it again in a different way or at a different time in a different place. Uh, and so you, you can't get discouraged by, by, by trying and failing things. Um, ultimately you just need to make sure that you're learning lessons from those. And like really the, the key to being an entrepreneur is to surround yourself with, with talented people to do the projects that you want. So you need to find people that really know what they're doing and you need to be able to work with them in a way that'll build something productive. Now, in, in terms of the skills you think you needed for success, you know, since you've already uh, sold, I guess, a company and you're looking for another venture, uh, what skills now, having already, you know, uh, created one company and starting another, do you, what skills do you think are needed to for success for, for an entrepreneur out there who wants to who wants to start his own business or is building one right now? Um, well, a lot of it will depend on the industry and the specific thing you're doing. So like in the, in the Bitcoin world, a lot of, you know, all the businesses basically are essentially software and technology companies at their core. So you, you need to be able to 
understand the technology and to find people who are you know really brilliant in it to to help build things that that haven't existed before um and you know in some in some lines of business it's really important to be able to to do business development to be able to to meet people who you can you know figure out partnerships with and to build a, a network of people that will will help your project and who who you can help as well um and in other in other projects it's more about like you know really precise um you know sort of like almost scientific level of of accounting for things so that you can uh so you can beat people on on pricing at a at a margin that no one else can compete with and uh it it just there's a lot of different a lot of different strategies that you can employ but it's really going to be based on what you're doing yeah, and I think tri trial and error is important. I mean, you got to be willing to fail, like you said. You got to you got to be willing to take some risk out there. Maybe not go all in on an idea or a marketing idea or something like that. But as as long as you're willing to try different things and see if they work and see what sticks, I, I think that's really important. Yeah, and know and know your industry and your field before you try to start something. That's really important. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Now, my last question for you, Eric, you, you mentioned the problems with, with actually gold, you know, and, and moving around physical gold. But a new a new venture, Bitgold, seems to have solved those problems where people can pay with a debit card. They can um, have their Bitgold account on a smartphone. They could pay with tiny amounts of physical gold. They can store it, you know, in different locations. They can take delivery of a very small amount of gold. Um, do, do you think then that this has a good chance of um, – of opening up people's eyes to how like uh, people can start using gold again, maybe for transactions in addition to Bitcoin then going forward? Well, this, um, yeah, Bitgold looks like they've executed this really well, but they weren't the first ones to successfully digitize gold. Uh, I think eGold was the, the first ones to really do this. And it's a, it's a great idea, right? Because gold is a really good form of money. It's, it's an, it's, it's the best store of wealth that society has ever had. Um, and if you combine that with sort of an electronic system that you can pay people digitally with, uh, it's, it's great. The only problem is that it is simply one centralized solution. And so if, if uh, you know, like in the case of eGold, when it got to a point that was big enough where it was actually being used as an alternative form of money by a significant number of people, uh, the government will just go in there and shut it down. And it's it's one entity and, and it gets destroyed. So um, I think now that things like Bitcoin exist, companies like Bitgold don't have that same danger anymore because um, you know stopping Bitgold doesn't stop alternative currency any longer. Uh, so I think there's a much safer environment now. So um, yeah, I you know I think it's great. I, I I would love the world to be able to to transact you know through digital means like like Bitcoin and to store wealth through things like gold. Um, anything that's anything that's not fiat, I think, is an advancement for humanity. Yeah, I think that's an important point you brought up. It seems, you know, whether it's Bitgold or Bitcoin, they seem to complement physical gold and physical silver uh, well. You know, one of them stores uh, wealth very well, but the metal itself is not necessarily great for transactions. But the other, the other two, the digital currencies, are really good for transactions. They're very efficient. You can use them on a smartphone and things like that. So I, I think they complement each other very well. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in the libertarian community. I'm sure you're aware of this. That are you know hardcore metal, hardcore gold bug or silver bugs. You know, I have to have metal. If it if you don't if you can't hold it, you don't own it, etc. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, um, you can hold Bitcoin, right? Like for for some reason, some people think that because Bitcoin's digital, it's not real. And and of course, ironically, they'll They'll tell you that opinion uh, by typing it out on their computer and sending it over the internet. You know, we use digital things all the time, and digital things are very, are very real indeed. The key about Bitcoin is that it's the first digital thing that that was scarce. Uh, there's there's only so many Bitcoins in existence, and so if you can, you know, be open-minded enough to realize that it doesn't have to be physical to to be real, um, and you if you can trust the mathematics behind Bitcoin, that there will only be so many bitcoins that are ever created then uh it's you know bitcoin is very similar to gold it is a it is a commodity that people find useful for the purpose of exchange and uh i think more and more people are going to realize how useful that actually is yeah when satoshi wrote his white paper i think he was he his goal of when he created bitcoin it was it was to create something very similar to gold that that um 
that solved some of the inefficiencies of gold that was easier to transact and it wasn't um you know there wasn't as many burdens so i, I think they complement each other very well most people in the libertarian community don't necessarily agree with you or me but um you know that's life <laughs> yeah it took it took it took me a while to to kind of convince a lot of the people up in new hampshire and in, in the free state project that bitcoin was worth their time because a lot of them were were very much you know it's only gold can be money um instead of instead of realizing that the the attributes that make gold such good money are in large part found in bitcoin and bitcoin has some additional attributes such as the ability to instantly be sent anywhere on earth to anyone at no cost um that make it you know the the best form of money that mankind has ever had it's not perfect and because it's young it it still has a lot of growing pains and and the the exchange rate volatility is scary for people um, but that's something that goes away in time as the market gets bigger. That, that can't be that can't be designed or, or controlled away. Yeah, I would rather have a free market in money and competing currencies rather than a government-imposed monopoly, even if it's a government gold standard. Because, I mean, look in the past with the financial history, governments have cheated on the gold standard too. So people – the gold standard is better than what we have now. Um, in terms of, you know, what the governments are doing with digital dollars and fiat currencies, uh, you know, debt created, uh, money, uh, money created as debt and then created out of thin air. But, um, you know, the gold standards aren't perfect either. Yeah. The, and the point is there shouldn't, there shouldn't be anything that is forced upon people as money by law. And in the same, in the same way that you want the choice to choose your car and your shoes and the food you eat and the house you live in. Uh, the most important good in society, which is money, you know, it's half of every single transaction. Uh, that that is perhaps the most deserving of competition and choice. That that you know, the fact that people can have the the ability to have honest money that that exists through its virtues coming out of a marketplace, um, it, it is profoundly important in in money. And anyone who thinks that uh, that they enjoy their their freedom and choice elsewhere need to be consistent about that. I completely agree. Um, I just want to thank you again for your time. You have, yeah, you have your writings there at your uh, blog, I guess, money and the state, but where, where else can people uh, follow your work or your thoughts on, on Bitcoin? Um, well, yeah, the, my blog is money and state.com. Um, the company I run is called shapeshift.io. And uh, then, you know, Twitter is probably a good way. Um, and that's just my, my my name is my handle. So at Eric Voorhees, spelled with a K. Uh, and yeah, you can you can follow me through those methods. Great. Well, uh, I really enjoyed our discussion here. I covered a lot of very interesting things. And uh, hopefully I can have you back on if you want to in, in you know, the near future to talk about Bitcoin and the blockchain. And um, hopefully you guys continue to make nice progress. It's good to see these uh, these central bankers start to sweat it a little bit. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't think they're sweating yet, but they will. Oh, I, I, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> they, won't, they won't admit that in public. They're will still, they, they're <laughs> still too they're... full of hubris. They still don't understand that. that currencies can compete with fiat but they'll they'll figure it out eventually uh hopefully hopefully uh, well I, I would love to see more free markets so um i just want to thank you again for your time eric i really appreciate it um, my listeners are going to really enjoy this interview um thanks again for your time thank you so much have a good one